Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Hi, I'm Holly. I'm an alcoholic. Hi. Thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Laura Lee, for asking me to speak. I'm going to move this deep. Is that okay? <clears throat> I um, I got sober in New York City, and it was the same format. It was the AG meeting. They called it Atlantic Group, and you couldn't touch the remote. You, sorry, you couldn't touch the uh, this thing, microphone. There was somebody who would do it for you. Um, and you guys have the same format, so. Um, my sobriety date is October 18th, 2013, and my home group is Saturday Lady Study in Shoreline, and um, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. I hope I can say something useful, or at least that somebody can relate to somewhat. I, um, I grew up in Eugene, Oregon, and... Um, you know, I had three older brothers, and I, I lived in a pretty rough household. There was a lot of verbal abuse and physical abuse, and I just pushed forward, which I, I just started, you know, that was like my motto, my life motto is just to push forward. And I would often think, um, like, I would just rather die than stay here. You know, just kind of like, that would just kind of catapult me forward in different ways. Like, I would just rather die, and I would, I'll just go there, you know? And so that's just kind of how it looked for me. I did, I did a lot of drinking early. Maybe 11 is when I started, and it, you know, wasn't too much of a problem until later. Um, you know, I got suspended from school a few times being drunk with friends, but part of my story and how I related to alcoholism was I was always around people that drank more than me. Um, I was always around the kids that liked to fight. And I was always, you know, be with the bullies. And and that's where I found comfort. And um, I just, you know, I just kind of tucked in there and that was my spot. That's where, that's where I like to be. So, um, that worked for me, and uh, then I tried to move on to California, and California didn't want me, so I ended up going to Maui when I was about 17. I moved to Maui, and um, we had a little family business, my mom, it was a little bakery, so I had a little bit of experience, but I never put together an honest resume. You know, I just always lied about everything, my experience and what I was able to do to get jobs. And I did get a job in Maui and I was uh, really just wanting to stay there. And so I uh, had a boyfriend, my first boyfriend ever. And I just kind of, you know, tried to get Maui to work for me in a way that I wanted it to work for me. And again, I, you know, hung out with the people who were doing the, the most business I was, uh, you know, who, who were up to no good. And, um, you know, I just found comfort there. I did some surfing. I, you know, I, I got into some trouble, but not too bad. You know, I never got into too much trouble that stopped me from catapulting things forward. So, um, I ended up lying my way into a job that uh, I was like a resort manager in this rural area, Hana, Hana Maui, for anyone who knows it. So beautiful. Um, And I kept meeting people from New York City. So I manipulated a a plane ticket to New York because New York was going to be my final frontier. You know, this is where I was really going to show everybody what I'm made of. And um, so I arrived in New York about, you know, 19, 20 years old. And, um, you know, I got the job and I certainly had the drive and I was going to make it happen. And I did end up having some success in New York. And um, 
I did end up, uh, you know, it was a long road there. It was a long road in New York, and it was hard. And I didn't know anybody, and nobody really knew me, but it made it all the easier for me to kind of manipulate my way through. Um, I think I was what you'd call, um, I was an opportunist, you know? I'd find opportunity and I'd really work it. And everyone who knew me kind of knew that about me, that I would, I would make it work. Um, because, you know, I'd rather die than stay where I was. So I had to continuously be moving forward. And so I did have, you know, some success in, in a chosen career in New York City. And the more and more I, you know, felt I had some success, the, the more and more I was drinking and the more and more lonely I felt, the more and more, um, you know, where it got to a point where I really had nobody I could talk to. Um, and I was so scared that I was going to kind of be found out somehow that all these things I was told as a child about myself, that how um, there was really some kind of defect in me. And that, you know, the time, I could feel the time was getting closer and closer to when I was going to somehow be found out. And, um, you know, it was around that time I started <laughs> looking into different, you know, self-development and different kind of things that could, that could maybe work for me. I did, um, I did end up meeting my husband around that time, and, uh, and so I, you know, I ended up getting married, and I thought, okay, well, maybe that's, that's the answer for me. Maybe that's, maybe that's kind of a, a good solution. Um, and, you know, my husband, we're still married now, he's, he's an alcoholic too, you know, we're both alcoholics, we both, um, and so when he came to me after we'd been married a few years and he um, had what he considered to be a bottom, he came to me um, and told me many things that he had done in blackouts and um, he kind of laid things out for me. Um, and, you know, uh, I thought, gosh, that's too bad for him. He can't drink, you know, it's a shame. <laughs> You know? <laughs> and I, you know, in a way I felt, uh, God, he ruined it for me. You know, we kind of, uh, thought we had this good thing going. Um, who am I, who, who am I going to, you know, drink with when I go to the pub? Who am I going to, you know, uh, he kind of, um, anyway, I went to Al-Anon from there. That's the sister group here. And, um, I hung out in Al-Anon for a few years, and it kind of ruined my drinking a little bit. Um, but it didn't stop me from drinking through my step work. You know, it didn't stop me from uh, moving that along. And what I found in Al-Anon was, um, it's you know, the 12-step program where I um, I worked the steps, and I was able to finally get honest with somebody. And that was my sponsor. And what happened was I went to an Al-Anon AA retreat. It was upstate New York. And um, I haven't missed it since. That was seven years ago, um, but four years ago since I got sober there. And um, it was my sponsor at the time. She we were supposed to do a 10 step or something and she was really upset and and I you know I I asked her what was wrong I, I didn't understand what was wrong and she told me that you know she was an alcoholic and I looked at her and I was like Amy I'm an alcoholic too and um and I could never take it back you know I tried <laughs> I tried and I tried to take that back and it, it never stuck. I just tried to backpedal as soon as I, you know. Um, but I felt when I said that, I felt freedom. I felt a certain freedom and it was only with her I think I could have been honest with because I really didn't know trust until until I met her, you know. Um, sponsorship is just, it's just, a, in my experience, it's just been miraculous. Um, because I never, I never felt 
uh, trust, you know, with people. And um, so I, um, what happened is I, I got sober um, and I was in day four at a retreat and I came home and, and, um, and I just immediately, I got pregnant. So on my fourth, fifth day of sobriety in AA, I was pregnant, you know, and, um, and then I was in the rooms, uh, really just not understanding this thing that we do here, not wanting to thinking it was all a big mistake. And, um, I didn't belong here. You guys didn't know what I came from. Anybody would have drank if they, um, they grew up how I grew up and, and I just didn't hear anything I could ever relate to. Um, so if you don't relate to me, just keep coming back if you're new, because you will, you know, for me, I did hear things that I related to eventually that really, you know, I am convinced today that, that I am alcoholic. I do belong here. And, um, so what happened for me is that, um, I was lucky in that my, my Al-Anon group, they, they participated in the same format you guys do here. And it's the Akron, you know, format. And so they, um, they stayed very close with AA. And so I had, um, I had AA in my back pocket all along. I just didn't know it. So I got a sponsorship and they really, you know, those women in AA, they just really circled their wagons around me, you know, and, um, with baby showers, with, um, just everything, you know, everything, cleaning out a closet or do, you know, I didn't know how to do anything before I got sober. Um, my life was a wreck. I was, you know, $150,000 in debt and I, um, was convincing everybody that everything was okay or that maybe it was my husband's fault, you know? <laughs> um, but the, the jig was up for me, you know, this was it. There was no, there was nowhere else to go. So, um, so I, I was just, you know, so moved by that. So what happened for me is that, um, I took direction, you know, I did what my sponsor had suggested. I heard what people said. I tried it. I continued to try it. I showed up for other people um, in the way they graciously showed up for me. And, you know, life just has started to look really different. Now I'm three and a half years in, and we moved out here so I could go to a school. It's part of a really, um, it's a, just a dream for me. And, um, you know, upon arriving in May of last year, we were convinced, you know, I really wanted to buy a house. That was a big thing here. I wanted to buy a house. Um, and so we found a house. It just, we, we went straight to the house and we made an offer and then we were going to close. And, uh, all of a sudden we didn't have a Washington state tax return. We couldn't close. And it was, you know, I've, I've learned and I've been told in these meetings and in AA that if you row the boat, uh, what is it? God won't row and I can't steer, right? So I need to sit in the boat and I need to row and God's going to steer. And, uh, and so this thing wasn't working out. I had to go to family and ask him to co-sign and, and they didn't, they didn't want to. So, um, that was May, June, July. Um, I had one last option, you know, I just kept rowing this boat and I went to the owners and I wrote a letter saying, uh, that, you know, that we wanted to live in the house that we'd want to rent it and that we'd want to just buy it when we could. And, um, what happened is, um, they said, okay. And we just signed the paperwork on Friday to buy it, you know? And, uh, these are just, these are just so many, I have so many miracles of being here. And, um, I used to think it was just some big, you know, um, that I, you know, I don't know what I thought, but whatever I thought, it just didn't work. Right. What works for me is coming here and listening to you guys and working these steps and having sponsorship, um, I mean, I have a life, and I know we say it often, but it it's true for me. I can't believe it. If it's true for me, it could certainly be true for you. Um, but it's just this life of my wildest dreams that I'm, um, you know. So now I have two boys, 
two babies, because of course, got pregnant right after the first, again, uh, before moving across the country with, with both of them. Um, and they're a year and a half, a year and a quarter and two and a half. And um, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm beyond blessed. And, um, and I'm just so grateful to be here. And thank you all for being here. <laughs> I'm Annalisa, and I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Annalisa. My sobriety date's in June 24th, 2014, and I picked my sobriety date out of a weird way, and I'll explain later on. My current home group is Atmosphere. It's a really great meeting. So what it was like back then, I started my drinking career at a rather young age. I started about 10 and a half, and I grew up in an alcoholic home, and um so I was always around it so I could get easy access to it, you know, nobody would really notice. And it didn't really start going up until um, until my mom went into treatment, ironically enough. And then um, and then I lost my mom to this disease when I was 13. And that's when my alcoholism got really out of control. Um, you know, I had fake IDs by then. I would go out and drink with whoever. I didn't even know half the time what I was drinking, who I was with. I didn't really give a care you know I just I just needed it you know I if I got a good grade at school that was a reason to drink if I had a terrible day that was a reason to drink I didn't need a reason any reason was a reason enough and by my freshman year towards the end um I was kind of forced into rehab by my psychiatrist you know I kind of was pushing fell on my face and I didn't really know what to do with myself I was fortunate enough that I got to pick where I wanted to go, and I decided to do outpatient when I was going through withdrawals, which really sucked, and taking finals. Um, but I was determined after 30 days in my treatment center that I was going to quit because I don't have a problem with alcohol. You know, I mean, obviously I didn't have a problem, otherwise I wouldn't be forced in there. You know, everybody's crazy but me. <laughs> and how I knew this was. When I couldn't control my drinking with vodka or tequila, I would switch between the two. And if I couldn't do it with either of those, then I would move on to drugs. And, you know, I always thought I was going to find this happy medium balance. I'm going to drink like a normal person. I'm going to use like a normal person. And it took me a long time to think that, well, I can't really use like a normal person. So I got, technically the first day I was fully sober was June 7th. But I picked June 24th because that was the first UA I had that nothing was in my system, everything was fully out, I was fully sober and I was fully clean, you know, <laughs> besides nicotine that was in me. And I remember at 30 days, I went in to a meeting to get my 30-day coin and that was going to be it, you know. I was scared of everybody, I was sitting in the back with somebody from treatment with me, I was shaking and I was crying and I got there 10 minutes late and I left 10 minutes early because I didn't know why everybody was being so loving and caring and hugging and why everybody was so concerned about a person that they didn't know. And after that, then I was determined, you know, to go out and start drinking again. But I didn't, for some reason. And I came back the next day because I was curious as to why all of you were so loving towards each other when I couldn't even love myself. And so I started going to meetings. I found a home group with a bunch of people that I thought were fascinating enough, and I kind of wanted what they had. I still didn't fully believe I had a problem with alcohol or drugs for that matter. I thought I was, could still be a normal person. And then I got myself a sponsor and I decided I would start working the steps because, you know, I was bored. You know, maybe I do have a problem. I started thinking to myself, you know, if I started looking back on old social media accounts at, you know, everything is recorded, taped, pictured this day and age. And I looked at <laughs> things I was posting, things I was doing in videos. And I was ashamed of myself, you know? And then I started becoming ashamed that I have this disease. You know, I didn't want to believe I did. I didn't want to be like my mom. I didn't want to be like anybody else in my family. Because I didn't want to believe I was. You know, I thought it was the end of the world to be an alcoholic. And in all actuality, it really isn't. You know, I have a new sponsor that I've had now for 10 months and she's taught me how to love love myself love others and accept love and that you don't have to go seeking for it because it's going to come to you as long as you are open and welcoming and accepting towards it you know and it took me a, I'm a really hard 
or I don't learn well, you know, I'm very stubborn. And it took me coming back over and over again, even when I'm very uncomfortable, even being here right now, it makes me very uncomfortable speaking in front of other people who I don't know very well, who I don't even know at all, you know, and, but my hope is that I can, by my message can come out and help another person, somebody who is around my group, you know, I'm rather young, I'm still a senior in high school, you know, I'm graduating, if I wasn't sober now, I can guarantee you I wouldn't be graduating. I wouldn't be getting an award out of school for service hours and helping out my community. You know, I wouldn't be going to college. You know, I wouldn't have the life I have today. I wouldn't have the people in my life I do now. If I wasn't sober, I'd be out God knows where, doing God knows what, trying to get booze. You know, I would be the low life of this like beer. And, you know, that's who I was. You know, it took me a long time to pull myself back up again. And by working the program, and coming back, I I learned that it's not just okay to have this disease of alcoholism, but I am grateful for it at the end of the day, oddly as that sounds. I wouldn't want to be any other way. I wouldn't be the person I am today. I wouldn't know who I know. You know, I had to, I had to learn the hard way from what I did. But at the same time, I'm grateful I learned it at a young age because by my freshman year, you know, my kept getting kidney infections. I, my liver started <clears throat> acting up. I started to turn yellow. It got so bad that I would have to go and bring alcohol to school and a water bottle so I could hide it so I can just get barely through the day, you know? And now I don't even have to worry about that, you know? It makes me sad when I see the people out there who are still struggling with this disease who don't have another way out. And I feel like by coming to meetings and listening to everybody, you know, even if you don't want to be there, you're going to find, I feel like, some type of hope like I did. Because, like I said, I was stubborn. I didn't want to listen to any of you. All of you were too kind and too loving and too hugs for me. You know, I didn't want any of it. You know, who <laughs> wants to sit in a basement, in a church basement, for an hour to two hours, you know, listening to people or talking or being around anybody you don't want to know? Because, you know what, I didn't want that. I'd rather been at home, alone, or in an alleyway, drinking or using. You know, that was my life. That's what I thought life was about. And it took me, it saved me almost three years to know that that's not what it's about. That's not all that this life has to offer. And it's truly a beautiful gift, you know. And there's times when I stray away from meetings. You know, my sponsor lives almost 2,000 miles away from me now. You know, and I, I don't show up for her. And then I started to get urges again. Like, I think this might be a really great time where I can just go out and have a few drinks with a few friends, you know? But that's not a great idea for me. I know exactly where I'm going to end up. I can get a DUI. I could kill somebody. I can end up hurting myself. Because the next time I go out, I know that there's a really great chance I am not going to come back. It's already hard enough coming back the first time. I don't want to imagine what it's going to be like coming back the second time. I don't ever want to put myself back out there where I was with feeling so terrible about myself, about the world, having bad images about that and everyone else around me being scared and frightened and so much self-hatred and deprecation towards myself. I never have to feel that way again, you know, and I learned by working the steps that I never have to, you know, I never have to go back out. Nothing is worth ever drinking or using over. You know, as the easiest thing is to not drink. The hardest thing is to keep going and to work the steps. It's a simple program. There's only 12 steps. I'm pretty sure almost all of us can count up to 12. But it's actually <laughs> doing the steps. That's the hardest thing. Being brutally honest with yourself and others. And that was something that was really difficult for me. Finding all my character defaults. Finding what I needed to better myself as. You know, my, I gave up on the program when I, six months ago, when my first sponsor dropped me twice because of my six step. And then I found a new sponsor, let alone did I know she was all about love and being compassionate towards others. And I hated that about her. <laughs> and, you know, she's like, I had to hug somebody every day. Somebody I didn't know, I had to go up and hug them. You know, and that was really embarrassing and hard for me to do. 
She gave me the worst service position. I am now a greeter at my home group, and I hate it. I've, you know what I do? I hug everybody. They, now I know names. Now I'm letting them love me and see me for me. You know, I'm not hiding in the very back, you know, trying to make sure nobody's seeing me. You know, I mean, I did hide in my car before the meeting because I didn't want to come here. But, you know, <laughs> I still, I got my, I got up out of my car. I walked in with Miss Herring, and I'm here now, you know. Before I wouldn't have done that, I wouldn't have even given it a second thought. I wouldn't have even waited for somebody. I would have left. I didn't care if I gave somebody my word, because back then my word meant nothing. My word only meant something if I was going to go to meet you to drink or get loaded with you. That was it. That's the only time you knew my word was good, because I was getting something out of it, you know? And now I can say, if I give somebody my word, they know I'm giving it to them and that I'm going to show up. Before I never showed up, I didn't show up to my mom's own funeral. I was, I was drunk at her funeral. I don't even remember half of it, you know? And now when another family member of mine is dying, I can show up in the hospital for them completely sober and be there for them to hold their hand and make sure that they know that's going to be okay. Now I can go and help out other alcoholics and hold their hands and let them know it's going to be okay, just like people did for me. Even if I don't want to do it, even though I don't want to be talking now, it's going to maybe help somebody like how with going to speakers meeting really helped me because I didn't have to say anything. All I had to do was listen. I just had to sit in the damn chair and listen, you know, you don't have, it doesn't take very, it's not hard to listen. You know, you're just using your ears. God already gave you them. And <coughs> it's a magical thing to be sober. You know, all the new things I experienced, like my story, it had a relapse in it. I relapsed a lot in the beginning, you know, before this, this is my fourth time coming around. Now I have almost three years. Now I have love in my life. I have people in my life who will go up to bat for me in a second. Who are at my who? If I'm having a bad day and I'm having and I want to think about getting loaded. I can call somebody up and I know they're going to answer. And if they might not answer, somebody else is going to answer because that's what this is. This is a program of helping one alcoholic at a time because you might be helping somebody now, or and then later on. They're going to be able to help you. It's a cycle. You know, you might be having a bad day and they're having a great one and then roles are reversed. You know, it doesn't matter how little or how much time you might have. Whatever you have to say or just by being in a room makes a world of a difference for a person, especially coming in. Even if you're not just coming in, you know, life sucks. Bad things happen, you know, but if I didn't have the tools I had now and with all the terrible things that have happened while I've been sober. I wouldn't have made it. I know that. I would have been dead by now. If I was already having turning yellow by the age of 15 and a half, I can guarantee you by being almost 19, I'd be dead. You know, I wasn't going to quit. I wasn't going to stop drinking to please others. I didn't give a crap about others. I only cared about me and myself and I. And, you know, it's a really... I'm very amazed by how far I've come. I don't always realize it because sometimes I still think I'm that 10 year old starting, you know, just trying out alcohol for the first time, figuring out why my mom loved him more than me. And then now I, now I know, you know, it was, it was a demon living inside of her, just how it lives inside of me, you know, just cause I'm not feeding it now. doesn't mean that's not inside of me or constantly growing. You know, it looks for my slip ups to come and attack me. You know, and if I don't stay strong to my program, it can overpower me. I know that. I know that about myself. I know if I stray away, I have a greater chance of relapsing than when I'm with a room full of people I don't even know. Because we all have the same disease, you know. We have different stories, different pasts, different futures, but we all have the same thing. We all have this underlying disease. And we all want help for it. Otherwise, I don't think any of us would be here if we didn't want to help. You know, and that's just my own personal belief. You can agree or disagree with that. And I really appreciate Ms. Herring giving my number out to somebody asking me to come and speak tonight. <laughs> you know, it's kind of kind of a little weird for me. You know, I was I was honestly I was kind of upset. You know, <laughs> I didn't want to be here, but I'm very glad that I am here and that I did get to come up and speak and share a little bit about my story because basically it was terrible before I got sober. You know, I was in a way dying. I was half dead and mentally and I was physically on my way to death. And here I am now 
about to graduate, moving on further in life, you know? I got to go to Minnesota to see my sponsor and we got to embrace the love and sponsorship that we shared together. You know, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for AA or NA. I'd be dead, you know, and I couldn't imagine that. I couldn't imagine being dead when I've experienced so much life in this little few years, you know. So thank you for letting me share. Hi, my name is Cindy and I'm an alcoholic and um, I'm happy to do this. You know, I, I really like this meeting a lot. I come almost every week and I was like, you know, I should go up there and tell my story sometime. Um, my sobriety date, and it just worked out because I told him I'm getting a cake. So I just turned two on Friday. My sobriety date is 1-23-2013. So I just celebrated two years. And my home group is Monday Night Women's Rendezvous meets at St. Paul's. I have a sponsor, Liz, and she has a sponsor, and I have worked all 12 steps. Um, but, you know, uh, when we talk about in here, uh, what's the phrase, sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. I was one of the sometimes slowly ones. I was a little bit of a, a rocky road for me. So let's see, real briefly, um, I was born in Astoria, Queens, New York, um, my mom was a physician. My dad was a stockbroker, just like Bill W. And um, he ended up he ended up being an alcoholic. You know, my parents are both Irish, and he was kind of the typical, you know, Irish. Like when I drank, I was always like, "I love you. You're my best friend." But when my dad drank, you know, he was grumpy. He's sober now. I just saw him two weeks ago at a funeral, and and he is sober now and doing well. Um, but I grew up, you know, with him. Uh, being very violent. He didn't hit me or my brother, but definitely um, hit my mom and like broke her shoulder and, you know, did a lot of bad stuff. So I was afraid of him growing up. My parents got divorced because of all that when I was five and I grew up in New Jersey, um, you know, with mainly my mom and my dad moved to upstate New York and I would just see him kind of like every six months, twice a year. Um, he did get me to love football because uh, he had season tickets to the New York Jets. And so I'd go and watch the football game with him. And I grew up watching Joe Namath play. And I'm now a big Seahawks fan, but he got me my love of um, of football. So, you know, I was kind of, he always drank either beer or like scotch. And I hated that smell of scotch. So anyway, I wasn't somebody who was adventurous at all. Um, my mom was my big role model. I wanted to be a doctor just like her. So I was kind of, you know a nerd in school. Um, I was like on yearbook and in glee club and did drama. And I had my first drink at a keg party when I was 16 senior year, which felt kind of late to me because a lot of my friends had had drinks and, you know, it was like Budweiser or something and I did not like it at all. Um, so I really didn't drink much in high school at all. Then I went to college and in college, what I did kind of like were they had Bartles and James wine coolers, if you remember those. And I kind of thought those were pretty nifty. So um, I would kind of try to drink those. Um, I skipped a year when I was in elementary school, and the only way, reason I say that is my birthday's in April, and I turned 21 in April and graduated from college in May. So I really didn't go out to bars much at all. Um, then I went to med school and I did a little binge drinking in med school. We would have exams just once a month and like, you wouldn't really drink all that much. And then we'd go to a bar and, you know, I guess I would have like five drinks, but so did most of my friends. So I didn't think that much of it at all. So anyway, my drinking career really kind of started, um, in my thirties. So I came out here to go to residency at UW and, um, also came out, discovered I was gay when I was about 25 and, met my partner and we settled down and had kids and, um, kind of, fin you know, finally got my first real job and became friends with, um, a couple of women who were older than us. And they kind of were a little bit sophisticated and they taught us how to play golf and they taught us about wine tasting. And so I kind of started to drink wine in my thirties and it seemed like I have arrived, you know, kind of like a, like a, like a, a thing like that. When my drinking really started to be a problem was we had a, a three-year-old and then twins. Um, my partner gave birth to all three of our kids. We did a sperm bank, and she was more the traditional mom that stayed home, and I was kind of the dad who went to work every day. I was the breadwinner. And, you know, infant twins is a bit much, you know, <laughs> with a toddler and, you know, 
you know, working. And then what happened at the same time was my mom um, had a stroke and she became disabled. And so my brother was a full on alcoholic drug addict at that time, like literally homeless on the streets of New York and couldn't be helpful. So I moved my mom out here and put her in assisted living and kind of managing her was like kind of a part time job because she would get forgetful. She'd call me three times a day. She'd want to see me every day. And definitely that's when you know, things kind of started to get out of hand because, you know, I would look forward to my one glass of wine at dinner, but then, you know, it was two and then it was three. And then I remember, oh, you know, but, you know, obviously my ex would make comments when I had more than, you know, two glasses of wine. So I was like, oh, I'll buy it by the box and I'll keep it hidden in the garage. So I started buying it by the box. And at the time I totally rationalized that I was like, well, if you were married to my wife, you'd do this too, you know, and totally started to do that. And I was remembering when I just said I'd tell my story. So the t in 2006, which was, um, I guess, nine years ago now, when the Seahawks were in the Super Bowl, that's when my alcoholism was just starting because I looked up online, and if, if, a, if an NFL game starts at 1, they serve drinks until the beginning of the fourth quarter. But if it starts after 3, they only serve till halftime. And I got tickets to the NFC Championship game. They were playing the – Carolina Panthers that year and I was like well that's not going to be enough time to drink so I got my camel back and I filled it up with wine and I had it under my sweater and under my coat and I just like you know made sure that I only looked at my partner like this and I got nervous because they frisk you when you go in and I was like oh shit if I get caught this is going to be embarrassing but they just kind of went like this and they didn't notice the lump and see, like, now it's so obvious that that is alcoholic thinking, but I was like, I am so smart because I don't have to wait online. And, you know, they charge you, like, eight bucks for that little thing. And I have, like, you know, three bottles on my back, and nobody knows. So, like, to me, I was just reminding, like, okay, that was clearly alcohol. And I thought I was so smart, but when I went to rehab, which I did more than once, like, all the rehab got were like, Pfft. Yeah, I did that. We do that skiing. I guess that's a big thing. If you're an alcoholic skier, you wear vodka on your back. So anyway, so, um, so you know, things kind of happened where I was started hiding. I started lying. I started sneaking. I definitely was in denial because I never drank in the morning. And kind of I would try to balance it up like I'd sign up for a couple half marathons a year. And I'd be like, if I can run a half marathon, I can't really be an alcoholic. Well, you know... Stuff happened at home, and I just wasn't present a lot, you know. And, you know, if we got invited to, like, a party with our peps friends, like, I'd get drunk, you know, and be stumbling and be messy. So there was definitely more and more friction at home. And then it came to a head, uh, again, Super Bowl. I was like, you have to drink for the Super Bowl. I went to my first AA meeting in, like, 2009, and it was at St. Paul's Living in Sobriety. And now I love that meeting, but, like, my first time there, you know, I thought it was a little bit of a different crowd. I was like, I don't fit in here. I don't belong. And But anyway, so it was Super Bowl Sunday the year the uh, Saints won, and I was hiding alcohol in my bathroom, and I was drinking all during the game. And by the end of the game, I was totally passed out. And so then my ex was – well, she's now my ex. She was like, you got to move out. So then I moved into an apartment for only a few months, thankfully, because that's when the wheels came off the bus, because then I didn't have to hide anything. And what really got me into treatment was um, I ended up getting drunk one night, and I had only been in this apartment a few months, and I guess I was in my pajamas, and I got up to, like, I had to pee. But instead of ending up in the bathroom, I ended up passed out in the apartment hallway with, like, my pants down. And somebody saw me and called 911, and I woke up at Harborview. And I'm just going to say this because it kind of says, so I was like, I'm Dr. Smythe. I'm fine. Let me go. And they're like, no, we're reporting you to the medical board. So even though it was a weekend, I, was, I had a lot of resentments about this because it was a weekend. I wasn't on call. I wasn't working. I wasn't driving. But basically, if you're a doctor and you show up in the ER drunk, you are getting reported to the board. So then I met with them the next day, and they're like, you're leaving tomorrow for treatment for 90 days. And I was, you know, not happy because, of course, no one at work knew anything. I had a lot of shame. So, you know, I went into that treatment very resistant, and not surprisingly, you know, it didn't work. And 
you know, then I had a relapse and I had to go again. And, you know, it was kind of, I was doing a lot of in and out of AA. I was like trying to buy, buy into it, but not really focusing on the differences, not the similarities. And basically I had my third relapse. And so I monitored, I have to do UAs every week. And so in 2012, I had my third relapse. And even though nothing had happened at work, just because, you know, I had my third relapse, I had my medical license suspended. And that really crushed me because my whole ego was wrapped up into my profession. And um, so, you know, I have what's my current wife who's very supportive, but, you know, this disease just breaks you down. And I got suicidal. And, um, you know, I'm so crazy because, you know, I didn't really want to kill myself, but like I thought I did because, you know, I, I was like, I can't, I can't imagine a life with alcohol, can't imagine it without it. So, um, so I read online how to research things. I literally went to Fred Meyer. It was like January and bought this barbecue grill and put it together and put up charcoal and duct taped all, you know, the windows in my bath bedroom and lit this charcoal grill on fire because I had researched that the lead singer of Kansas had killed himself that way. And, <laughs> and, and, Michelle comes over and is like, what's that smell? And there's like smoke everywhere and, you know, this and that. And, um, and I had, you know, left a letter to my ex saying, you know, tell the kids I love them. But by the time you read this, I'll be dead. So I didn't die. Then she called the cops and then, you know, I get brought to the ER. And so two years ago at this time, I was in the Swedish psych ward at um, First Hill. And that's really where I did finally have my spiritual moment. Cause I was just totally broken. I was crushed. I was looking around at people who, you know, were really pretty ill and kind of scary. And I was like, okay, God, I give up. I mean, I, I really give up. And I had thought, honestly, I had surrendered a few other times, but I hadn't. And from that moment on, I have been like, I will do whatever it takes. And, you know, it took me two years to get my license back, but I got it back last summer, and I have a great job now. I work downtown. I love my job. I couldn't see my kids for a while without supervision because of, you know, all the relapses I had had, so I had to have a year's supervision of every time I saw them, but, you know, now I don't have that anymore, and um, we've want, got on some great vacations. We're going to Hawaii for spring break. I got married last summer to my partner, Michelle, who she's three years sober, even though she's not really an alcoholic, so it's kind of funny. But, you know, ever since I met her, I said, because I was, you know, 10 months sober at the day, she's like, okay, well, if you don't drink, I won't drink either. And, uh, you know, uh, so it really, it, the promises really have all come true. You know, everything that was a mess now is really great, and I do have to thank this program for it. And, um you know, I'm even sponsoring people now, which is a miracle. And I like going to AA meetings. So if you're new and you're kind of like, I really don't like coming, it is true what they say. All that stuff, keep coming back, keep coming back. They used to say, don't leave before the miracle happens because I really got depressed. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm just going to be one of these unfortunate few that doesn't get it. And, you know, like when I went to treatment a few times, my counselor was like, you know, you can't be too dumb to get it, but you can be too smart to get it because, you know, you think you're better, you think you're this, you think you're that. And I kind of did, you know, and so uh, definitely being a doctor did not help me with this disease at all, at all. So um, I really had to get humble and, you know, I just went to two to three meetings a, a day. And then um, for a year and a half, because I had to have some income, I had no income, um, I got a job at the prison. I worked as a health educator. And um, I ended up telling my boss, you know, and everything, because, of course, they were like, well, why is a doctor applying for this job? And so I just told them the truth, even though I had a lot of shame about it. Um, and they were really great to me. And I really it, – it was a very educational experience because, you know – I don't really know what, you know, these prisoners, they're all very nice. It was the male prison in Monroe. It was all men. And, and, you know, the first time I was there, I had like 30 of these men in a room with me, a lot of whom were murderers, you know, child molest, who knows what they were. You know, I was scared. But at the end, I realized, you know, again, that's not for me to judge. You know, I'm no better than anyone else. I definitely could have been in prison for, I definitely drove drunk and drank and drove a number of times. 
I hit two parked cards, but thank God I never hit anybody, so I could totally be D in jail. So it just made me realize, like, you know, uh, if you relapse, I definitely do think that I will die um, if I relapse. So that is not something I ever want to do, and I'm going to keep coming back. So thanks for asking me to speak. Um, I'm Rebecca. I'm an alcoholic. My sobriety date is January 29th, 2010. I have a sponsor, Christine J., that's here tonight, back there. Um, I feel like for many of us, uh, alcoholism runs in the family, and for me especially it does, um, on both sides of my family. Um, I first got caught drinking when I was about 13 or 14, and my parents sat me down and um, told me, you know, the the dangers of drinking alcohol, and that especially for me that I was predisposed to having having pro problems controlling it, and uh, that it would probably affect me differently than my friends. Um, my young, like, growing alcoholic brain didn't really hear the caution in that story. Um, I heard more like, well, some people, you know, breed athletes. You know, maybe my family just breeds good drinkers. Um, so I thought that I would make that like my familial, you know, destiny is to be a really good drinker. Um, so I ran rampant with that through my teenager's year, years and, um, you know, through high school, I was kind of the ringleader making knew where everything was going to be, where, how to get it, um, where the party was. And it got really out of control and really scary quickly. Um, I was caught at a party, I think, um, you know, where the cop showed up and uh, my parents sent me to treatment when I was 16. And so this is my first bout with treatment. And, um, you know, I did the Lakeside Milam Adolescent Intensive Outpatient Program, and it worked for me. I had to switch schools because there were lots of rumors going around, and most of them were true. Um, so I thought maybe a clean slate would be good for my senior year of high school. Um, and I stayed sober for a while. I, uh, I went to college in Chicago at DePaul University, and um, I was in, got uh, involved in the program over there. Um, and it was really good for the first two years of college. Um, and then slowly at the end of those two years, those first two years of college, you know, um, put months between meetings and weeks between calling my sponsor and that little alcoholic in my brain started to think, Maybe you were just a party kid that got caught. Maybe you really didn't have a problem. I'm 20. I'm an adult now. I can drink responsibly, right? And so I tried. Um, I decided that this was a good, a good testing. It's not even legal at this point, right? I'm still 20. Um, <laughs> it's a great idea. So I decided to try to uh, start drinking again. And for a while, I was surprised I wasn't quite off to the races like I thought I would be. Um, you know, it, it was a slow go getting back to it. And I think that was partially because I was scared of where I had been, um, with my drinking in my adolescence. And I was in a relationship at the time and, um, we were both drinking. So I think it was less obvious than it was just like one person, um, that was really out of control and whatnot. Um, and so towards like the end of, I'd been drink drinking for about two years at this point, And, um, starting to do more of the drunk driving and more of the um, just reckless behavior and making sure there was always alcohol available all day, every day, um, you know, wherever I was, whether it was home or I was out or whatnot. Um, and uh, so I was living with this man and, you know, I thought like, okay, I'd been through so much, you know, through my childhood and finally, okay, I'm living a functional alcoholic life. I'm in school. I'm doing well, you know things are good. And, uh, three days after I graduated college, um, he passed away in a motorcycle accident. And I just didn't think that was fair. I mean, it's death is never fair, but, um, I was like, man, I'd already been through everything. Like, why do I have to be dealt like this terrible hand again? Um, you know, and so I was in Chicago. I just finished school. didn't have that keeping me here. I, there, I didn't have a job. I couldn't afford like this guy's house I was living in. Right. So I had to move home and, um, you know, I moved to my parents' house in Puyallup and, uh, my two older brothers were also living there at home in Puyallup. So my poor, poor parents, um, <laughs> you know, uh, so it was, you know, like the good old days and I just started drinking aggressively, um, and blacking out all the time. I'd reconnected with some high school friends and, um, 
you know, I would drive everyone. I would like start the night driving everyone out to these bars, knowingly that at the end of the night I would bring, I would drive everyone home drunk. You know, I started out knowing that that was going to be the case. And, um, that's where it got a little dodgy for me because like, I just didn't care. I knew I didn't have any disregard for myself or the people in my car, you know, my friends driving, let alone like there's good people on the road out there driving, you know, that I, I could severely affect their life or like, God forbid, take it from them. Um, and so I would do this over and over again. I would drive and I would drive drunk. And part of it was a little bit of trying to tempt fate. You know, maybe just maybe this misery and this despair, maybe I'll, you know, someone will hit me or I'll hit someone and I just won't have to live with like this pain and suffering anymore. Um, and so about a year after uh, the boyfriend had passed away, I was just like, man, nothing's changed. I'm like, I have a degree. I'm not doing anything with it at all. I'm doing some really awesome drinking. Um, you know, my relationships with my parents, which I once like really cherished, were just just absolutely nothing. No one trusted me. I was lying. I was stealing, you know, and it was, I was just sad. I didn't love myself. I didn't really care about anything. Um, and so I was driving home from a casino, which I frequented, frequented and, um, you know, I'd lost all my money that night. Surprise. I've been cut off from the bar and, um, you know, I was driving home on highway 18 and I was just like, I'm done. I'm so over this. This is just the life thing. This isn't working for me. Um, you know, and, uh, there was this bridge on highway 18 and I veered right and I floored the uh, gas pedal to the ground and I wanted to drive off this cliff and I tried and I hit a rock and I got a flat tire, you know, <laughs> and I was really mad. <laughs> like I'd come up with this solution for my misery um, you know, and I stumbled the car somehow back onto the side of the freeway and, um, and I just sat there. I was like, what do I do now? That's not going to work. I don't have a spare. Like I was really going to change the tire, but I mean, come on, uh, <laughs> running out of options. And so a uh, police officer came up and, um, you know, he, I got arrested for a DUI and I told him what I was trying to do. And so then, you know, I went to the ER and was evaluated, but somehow like that just wasn't enough for me. Like I just, I just still didn't see a way out. Um, and so I kept drinking and three months to the day later, I got my second DUI after a Husky game. Um, you know, my dad picked me up at the UWR and he was just like, man, you really got to stop this drinking thing. I was like, yeah, you're probably right. So I stopped drinking for about 10 days and then, uh, talking to my lawyer, um, you know, I figured out that I would be court ordered to go to treatment at some time. So I thought I'd just real, really give this alcoholism one last go, you know, before I had to go to treatment. Um, those last four months were really, really dark and scary. Uh, I was living in Georgetown in South Seattle. It's a very tight knit alcoholic community. Um, about seven bars and six blocks on a grocery store for miles. And I was closing down like nine pound hammer at 2 a.m. every night. It's just routine. Um, and it really enabled like the end of that alcoholic career. Um, and, uh, there was one incident a couple weeks before I got sober. Um, I had this party at where I was living on airport way. It was like a, a warehouse. Um, and I don't really m remember much about it except for the excess of alcohol and, and other substances that might have been there. Um, but I remember when I woke up and, uh, I went downstairs and my, we had this like locked gated garage parking thing. Um, he was like, Hey, yesterday you had a couple friends that were trying to get out of the gate and it was really annoying. Cause I like was woken up and had to go let them out. I'm like, Oh, don't you mean this morning? It's like, no, yesterday it's Monday. And so I had been passed out for the better part of 36 hours. And I don't know why, I don't know really what, what happened. Um, you know, I had no call, no showed for work. Uh, you know, I went, took this like confusion to the bar down the street and the bartender told me my mom had been calling the bar for a day and a half looking for me. Um, and that <laughs> your mom's calling a bar looking for you. This is no way now. Um, <laughs> you know, and I had a fractured wrist, like no one who's at the party knows how that happened or, or anything. Um, and so that was the first time that I actually was worried about myself. I'm like, just like, whoa, this is not, this is kind of getting scary. 
Um, and I knew that in the next week or so I would be going to treatment. Um, and I was ready for it. I was finally really, really ready to get sober. Um, and so I went, I went to Lakeside Milam intensive outpatient, outpatient program, um, on East Lake. And, you know, lots of people in Georgetown were like, Oh, so are you going to like drink Friday night and Saturday night? And then you'll still like have a clean UA on Monday. I was like, oh, that just sounds like such a hassle. Like, I don't want to do that. Like, I knew that if I wanted any life at all, like, I needed to get sober. I knew that, you know, that the program worked, the caveat being if you actually went to meetings and you worked the program with a sponsor, that it worked, you know, and you could have a really great life. And I wanted that for myself again because I didn't really have anything to show for it. Um, so I did that. I started going to meetings again. Um, I got a sponsor who's really amazing and awesome. Um, in the beginning, like the hard part for me wasn't necessarily like, I mean, not picking up a drink was hard, but it was just, I was so comfortable in this misery that I'd been living in for so many years. Like it's just commonplace. Like that was my norm. I was really good at being depressed. Right. And so like going to these meetings and seeing happy people and, and talking and getting excited about connecting to people and being excited about knowing that I'm going to have a clean UA, like that was all really good. But I just, these feelings were foreign, you know? And so that transition for me for like being okay with feeling positive things and happiness was, was the hardest transition for me in my early sobriety. But now like five years later, like that is my norm. Like I'm happy on a daily basis. Like life is really stable for me. Um, you know, I have a job and I'm in school taking prereqs for a master's program. You know, I have a plan and I'm doing it. Like I was able to buy a car without my dad co-signing. Like I never thought unless I was buying like a $500 cash car that I'd be able to do that. You know, like these promises do come true. Like if you make an effort, you know, um, and my program was a little, you know, I definitely always was in touch with that sponsor, but I was a little begrudgingly on some of my steps. Um, but uh, I finally did do the fourth and the fifth step at least, you know, <laughs> took a while. So glad she held my hand and pushed me when I needed it. Um, you know, and that was just so freeing and such an amazing experience, you know, and um, really eye opening to have my character defects, you know, read back to me. Um, but I'm able to like acknowledge those and deal with those on a daily basis when they do come up because, you know, we don't always want to let all of them go right away. Um, you know, and I actually, I've, I, uh, stumbled across my first four step notebook maybe about a month ago and it blew my mind. I didn't recognize half of the names of these people I had resentments against. And all, like, the petty little stuff that was on there, like, this girl said this about me, and I just don't believe it. It was just, like, you know, to, like, not even remember or have any of these things that were tied to so much hate and hurt and anger that just, like, brought me down on a daily basis. To just be free of that, like, was just so cool and eye-opening. Um, you know, my life is, is pretty routine right now with school and work and soccer. And like, I try and build my meetings into my weekly schedule, um, so that I'm held accountable. Like when you go to meetings regularly and then you don't show up for a while, like people notice and they'll call you or they'll text you or something like that. It's really cool to have people care about me, like in my sobriety and my well being, to be able to check in on me and being able to have those regular meetings is what makes that possible. Like if I just went to meetings and I've been guilty of this too, like you come in late, you leave early, you don't say hi to anyone. That's like bare bones, you know, that's like getting the education, but not being able to practice it at all. Um, you know, I try to talk, talk to new people, like new people, like call, pick up the phone. It's so good, at least for me to get out of my head and like be able to have some real heartfelt advice to give most of the time, uh, you know, and be able to listen to someone's someone news story because, you know, brings, brings the reality back of where we could be or where we have been. And it's really cool to see the light go on for, for newcomers and see that transition that so many of us have been through. Um, I'm, let's see, I'm the kind of person I have such a strong will that I know that I could go into a bar and I could have one drink and I could leave just to prove it to myself that I could do that. Be like, look, I'm not an alcoholic. I had one drink at a bar right? Alcoholics can't do that. Maybe the second day I could have two drinks. Maybe I'm not so sure about that. But I know by the end of the week, I'm going to be blacked out in a ditch somewhere because that's the kind of drunk I am. 
you know? And if I don't work this program and if I don't keep in touch with my sponsor and I don't call other alcoholics on a daily basis, like that's where I'm going to end up. So I have four seconds and I'm really grateful to be here. And (laughs) thank you. Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.